Well, that's great. <laughs> you live with a man for all those years and you never stop uh, living under his shadow, but that's okay. I can, uh, I'm proud to be my father's son. And as Groucho Marx once said, he's ashamed to be my father. Um, that's a paraphrase. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I can't tell you how much of a pleasure it is, except for those who organize this conference, including, including uh, Peter Schramm, who knows how close I came to not being here today. Uh, I missed the first flight and, uh, and managed to get on another one and, and arrived in the nick of time. And I had a very hard time escaping the clutches of Washington today. Uh, you may all have your feeling that you have having a hard time escaping the clutches of Washington every day. But um, I have one bit, of, uh, one bit of news from Washington. Uh, which I thought you might be interested to know, which is that the, uh, the crime rate in Washington has declined by 23%, and that's in the mayor's office alone. <laughs> For those of you who have not read this week's issue of the Weekly Standard, you do not know that I have shamelessly stolen that joke from Fred Barnes. And I'm sure when he tells it again, don't tell him that I already, that I already used it. I also... Uh, I want to congratulate the Ashcroft Center, and I want to congratulate all of you, because uh, in Washington, we are told frequently that the American people don't care about foreign policy anymore, that ever since the Cold War, the American people are only concerned about how much money is falling into their pockets, how much money is coming out of their pockets, and the larger issues of world affairs really have uh, disappeared for the average American. And as I look around this room, I see how untrue that is. I never believed it was true, and I'm gratified to see all of you here today and engaging in a series that is about American foreign policy for the future. I'm also glad to be here as part of a lecture series that uh, has been set up in the honor of William Casey. Uh, when, my, when I worked in the State Department, I happened to uh, be a deputy for Elliot Abrams, who was Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs, and my main job for three years was to work uh, on behalf of the Nicaraguan freedom fighters who uh, earned the name of the Contras from their enemies. And that program, as you probably know, was the brainchild of Bill Casey. That and the other elements of the Reagan doctrine uh, around the world, support for freedom fighters in Afghanistan, in Nicaragua, in Cambodia, and Angola. That program, that policy of the Reagan doctrine of supporting anti-communist insurgencies played a critical role, in my opinion, in uh, bringing down the Soviet empire. And uh, we really do have Bill Casey to thank for that. And in thinking about the Reagan doctrine and my own experience with the Nicaraguan freedom fighters, I just want to say one thing which I think is pertinent to what I'm going to be talking about today. Many people have viewed the Reagan doctrine, some people have viewed the Reagan doctrine, as a very pragmatic, realist approach to the problem of the expanding Soviet empire, which it was. But there's been a tendency to forget about the moral element of that policy. And uh, it's fitting that you're going to have Dinesh D'Souza here, because he's written very well about this. And there is, uh, in his book on Reagan, he points out that Reagan himself conceived of this doctrine uh, of supporting freedom fighters abroad not as just a question of uh, fighting the Soviets to the last Afghan or Nicaraguan, not simply a matter of bleeding the Soviet empire around its periphery. He conceived of his doctrine primarily in moral terms, uh, Mr. D'Souza writes. And that really is a critical element in understanding what Ronald Reagan was all about, what his foreign policy was all about. As you may remember, the, the Reagan doctrine uh, was not working very well in the early 80s. The Contras were not doing very well. The Afghan Mujahideen were not making a great deal of progress. And the pressure in this country to cut off funding for all these groups was enormous. Ronald Reagan felt a moral obligation uh, specifically to the people that we were supporting. He refused to abandon them. And he felt a moral obligation to bring democratic government or remove uh, Soviet tyranny uh, in the countries where these people were fighting for their freedoms. And I think that as we think about the foreign policy of the Reagan era, and I would hope of our foreign policy in the years to come, that we will remember how important, how vital the moral element is, the, the, the issue of American principles is in the conduct of our foreign policy. So with that as an introduction, I'd like to talk a little bit about the state of the world today 
and what it means for American foreign policy. The state of the world today is often uh, taken for granted, and that's a terrible mistake because the condition of the international environment, for all its many problems, for all the rise of ethnic uh, disputes, for all the difficulties that still exist with terrorism, nevertheless, from the point of view of the United States and for the world, the international system is in remarkably good shape. In fact, an unprecedented, we are in an unprecedented period in human history. We are in a situation where there is the usual great power conflicts that have riven this world for hundreds of years and led to world wars and other calamities. That great power conflict is today not present in our world. The United States today is by far the most powerful power and although there are nations that are dissatisfied with the current situation, ranging from Iran to China, to some degree Russia, nevertheless, at the moment, no power even pretends to wish to supplant the United States as the leading power in the world. And that lack of competition is an enormous force for peace, and one that we should not take for granted because it was difficult to obtain, it will be difficult to preserve. In addition to which, we have a situation which I know that there are a lot of uh, political scientists and political science students out there. We have a situation which violates all the laws of international relations as they have been taught over the last 40 or 50 years. Because what's supposed to happen when a great power like the United States emerges to preeminence is that all the other powers in the world are supposed to feel threatened by, that, by the presence of that great power not only uh, potential enemies, but even allies are supposed to become nervous and eager to hem in that great power. The, what the political scientists like to call the bandwagoning effect is supposed to occur, the, the building of a new set of alliances to contain the new power. Well, we know that that has not happened. The NATO alliance, whose purpose, as we recall, was to contain the Soviet Union, has not dissolved after the Cold War. In fact, although the European powers sometimes grumble about American arrogance and American pretensions to hegemony, the fact is those allies, as well as our allies in Asia, particularly Japan, but also in Southeast Asia, their greatest fear today is not that the United States will exercise its power too greatly at their expense, but that the United States will withdraw into itself and, and destabilize a situation which has been so much in their interest. This is a remarkable development, and again, one that we should not take for granted. The other, the other factors of the, the other characterizations of the international environment are also uh, remarkable. We have seen an enormous spread of democratic governance around the world in the last 20 years. Uh, again, not all the democracies are perfect. Many of, some of them are failing. Others are on the edge. Nevertheless, we have seen a flowering of democracy in the world unprecedented in human history. I happen to believe that the victory of the United States in the Cold War and the exertions by the United States in the Cold War had a great deal to do with this. But whatever the cause, the values that the United States has always upheld uh, have been adopted by millions and millions of people all around the world of very diverse cultures, very diverse capabilities. It is often a joke that people suggest that the United States wishes to, re, wishes to change the world to make it fit its own image. Well, whether or not that has been the goal of American foreign policy, at times it has, it is the case that in the modern world, the modern world is shaped in America's image much more than anyone had any reason to expect. Along with this, of course, has been a tremendous period of economic growth and stability, one which clearly benefits the United States, but which has also benefited others. You put all these things together and you have to say that the world is not only in an unprecedented period of, of peace and prosperity, but that this world is shaped uh, around and very much in the service of America's ideals and America's most fundamental interests. We need to recognize, however, how we got to this world and what is needed to sustain it. Because there are two dominant errors uh, at large today in the current thinking about American foreign policy, both intellectual errors. I'll divide them into two, basically. One is what I will call the myth of globalization. 
Now, the myth is not that there is globalization. Clearly, we are in a period where cultures are meshing, where economic interdependence is growing, where the communications revolution has brought the world closer together, uh, multinational corporations do their business across national lines, uh, citizens of different countries band together uh, for a variety of causes, whether you like them or not, and we do have a situation of much greater uh, global interdependence than we've ever had before. The myth, however, is that this and this alone will make it impossible for there to be war between the great powers in the future. The notion that because people trade with each other, they cannot possibly go to war with each other. The notion that people talk to each other on the internet will not find themselves in great international disputes. This has taken hold in certain quarters, not least, I would say, within this present administration. When this administration looks at China, which is an emerging power in a traditional geostrategic sense, they take faith in the notion that globalization alone will solve the problem of an emerging China. That if we make enough deals with China over greenhouse gases, over trade, over other issues of uh, communications and economics, that this alone will be what is essential to preventing any possibility of conflict in the future. We are living in an age in which a certain kind of economic determinism has taken hold. And this is not just a problem on the liberal side of the intellectual divide, but also on the conservative side, where it is assumed once again that trade is going to be the solvent of all international problems. That if we can just promote trade in various different countries with different countries like China uh, and others, that this will be the solution to our international problem. Former Clinton administration official Jeffrey Garten wrote an article in Foreign Affairs saying trade should be the number one policy of American, of American international strategy and that all other foreign policy issues should be subsumed to trade. But in Congress and among the business community, in, uh, especially among some of the large corporations, this idea that trade uh, solves everything ha has taken hold. And this is a pernicious development, in my opinion, because it ignores what I think are enduring realities of mankind, enduring realities that have led to innumerable wars over the, over the millennia, and which I think have not changed, and which trade will not be a barrier to. If you go back to the 19th century, you will hear the exact same arguments being made by men like Richard Cobden, by John Stuart Mill, by John Bright, the so-called Manchester School, the Manchester liberalism, where it was believed then, in the latter part of the 19th century, that the fact that nations were now trading with each other, the invention of the steamship, the interdependence of that world had made war obsolete. And this view was held to by leading intellectuals across the world tenaciously until 1914, destroyed those dreams, and made it clear that the world had not changed as much as they had thought. There was another view abroad, and this I attribute, this I find mostly in conservative circles. And that is that now that the Cold War has ended, now that the great enemy of the United States, the Soviet Union, has disappeared, we can afford to lay down some of the burden of international leadership that we took up uh, in the Second World War and throughout the Cold War. We can return to normalcy, which you may remember was the rallying cry of the Harding campaign in 1920. We can be a normal nation now. We can let others pick up the burden. Our task should be essentially to stay out of trouble as much as we can, to sit back and wait for the next big threat to emerge, to keep our powder dry, to disengage to some extent. This view, like the other view, is reminiscent of an earlier period in our history. It's reminiscent of the view that did take hold in the 1920s and 30s. We were the, we were the strongest power in the world in that period. And the experience of World War I and the politics of this country following World War I led us into a period of isolation. And I don't need to remind anybody in this audience what the results of that policy were. Today we can see that these two guiding views of the world, on the one hand the faith in trade and globalization, on the other the yearning for the United States to pull back a little bit from the world and maybe not just such a little bit, we have seen what the consequences of this are already. Because we are now in a period of declining resources and declining will in American foreign policy. 
and those two are intimately related. Our defense budget is declining, our will to act is declining, and when our defense budget declines more, it reduces the will, and as the will reduces, the, the, the willingness to spend more money on defense declines. And so we are in a kind of a downward spiral, I would say a death spiral, uh, for American power in the world today. And I'll just go over a few basic figures for you. If you think about what has happened to America's military power uh, since 1986, which was the high point of the Reagan buildup, we have been in a steady decline. Every year for the last 13 years, American defense spending has declined in real dollars. Every year in the last 13 years. In the Bush administration, post-Cold War, Secretary of Defense Cheney and others worked out what they believed to be the minimum that the United States needed to maintain its commitments around the world, to maintain its power and influence around the world. They described it as the base force. The base force meaning that which we should not go below. Now there were those at the time, by the way, who thought that the base force was inadequate to what the United States needed to accomplish in the world. But let's look at what's happened since the base force was enunciated by the Bush administration. The base force called for 12 army divisions. Today we have nine and we're heading for eight. The base force called for 450 surface ships. You may remember that John Lehman, when he was Secretary of the Navy, was trying to head the United States up towards 600 surface ships. But in any case, the base force called for 450. We are now heading toward 300. The base force had 28 combat wings. We are now heading down toward 18. When you think about what this means, these are not just uh, numbers. Everybody thinks that there should have been a peace dividend from the war, uh, from the end of the Cold War. We've been spending that peace dividend every year. In my view, the peace dividend, and as others have pointed out, the peace dividend, peace dividend is peace. But in any case, the think about the consequences of this drawdown. If you remember the Gulf War, in the Gulf War, the United States used seven army divisions to dislodge Saddam Hussein from Kuwait and uh, gain victory in that war. Seven army divisions. We are now in a posture where we have nine army divisions total, as an I say, heading toward eight. If we had to fight another Gulf War today, we would have to pull troops from every other commitment around the world in order to do so. We would have to pull, out from, pull forces from Korea. We would have to pull forces from Europe. We would have to end uh, the operation in Bosnia. And even then, I'm not sure we could do it. And that's what's happened in just the last uh, six years or so. Well, we're cutting down on our force structure. We've got fewer men under arms. We had two million in the Bush years. We're down to 1.4. We're cutting down on our, on, our, on our weaponry. But surely, one might expect, we're taking the money that we're getting out of those savings and putting it into research and development, into science and technology, to develop the new generation of weapons to take advantage of the so-called revolution in military affairs so that we will have the high, highest tech cutting edge weaponry of the future. You might think that, but you'd be wrong. Since 1994, the resources devoted to science and technology in the Pentagon have declined by 20%. They're going to decline another 13% under the budget agreement reached in Congress this past summer by the year 2002. Research and development spending overall has declined 70% in the last 15 years. So in other words, we're cutting our force structure and we're cutting the amount of money that we spend on research and development. This, this downward defense spiral means that the United States cannot maintain the commitments that we have entered into over the past 50 years over the long term. The budget agreement of this summer has defense spending continuing to decline through the year 2002. What is the result of this? What would be the result of this? I think we can already see some of the result. What we are going to be doing is creating vacuums of power around the world. As the United States capabilities decline, our will to use those increasingly limited capabilities will also decline. Today we have a challenge from Saddam Hussein. He's uh, kicking out American uh, inspectors from the UN inspection team. We're looking into the development of Iraq's uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction programs. I think that Saddam has already calculated that a few cruise missile strikes he can withstand. He's not that worried about our cruise missile strikes right now. One might think that an appropriate policy to deal with Saddam Hussein today 
would be to build up our forces uh, on the border of Iraq and make it clear that continued misbehavior by Iraq is ult could ultimately lead to the United States finishing the job that it started in 1990. We don't have the capacity to do that. To put even 50,000 troops right now uh, into the Persian Gulf uh, to, to be able to deter Iraq and if, and, if necessary, do something about Saddam's misbehavior would once again draw down our capabilities significantly. In East Asia, meanwhile, as I said, we, China is, a, is an ambitious power. Its goals are clear. Uh, they make their own goals clear, and leading China scholars understand what China's ambitions are. China's ambition in, in the not too long term, 10 or 15 years, is to dislodge the United States as the predominant power in East Asia. In Europe, today, we have the happy circumstance of a Russia that is very weak. Russian defense spending is in decline. They're clearly in great need to fix their economy. But how long does that last? Maybe it lasts for 10 years, 20 years. Maybe it lasts longer. We can't be sure. And as a matter of fact, the United States is undertaking, rightly in my opinion, the expansion of our commitments to Eastern European countries so that we can provide stability in that region, and we hope uh, deter the Russians from even thinking about uh, trying to reestablish their dominion in Europe. Do we have the resources to back up those new commitments is the question that I think is increasingly being asked. A lot of people have been pointing to peacekeeping operations as the big problem in our defense capacities right now. They point to Bosnia and the expense of $2 billion a year and the, and the number of troops that are tied down in Bosnia. I won't debate right now whether we should or should not be in Bosnia, but I would leave you with this thought, that if the maintenance of 8,000 troops in Bosnia is eviscerating our military capacities and making it impossible for us to do anything else, the problem is not the 8,000 troops in Bosnia. The problem is that the United States does not have the military strength it needs to carry out its commitment in the world. I don't need to remind you that President Eisenhower dispatched 15,000 troops to Lebanon in 1958. President Bush dispatched 20,000 troops to Panama uh, in 1989. President Johnson dispatched 25,000 troops to the Dominican Republic. These dispatches of much greater troops, strengths, to these countries did not draw down American capabilities to the point where they could do nothing else. But that is increasingly where we are today. Now, I would like to talk about what needs to be done to, solve, to deal with these problems that we are creating. If you agree with me that the present international system is one that is immensely beneficial to the United States and worth preserving, the question is, how do we keep it this way? And the first answer, in my view, is to look at how we got here. How we got here was, one, the enormous buildup, the, the largest peacetime military buildup in, uh, in history undertaken by the Reagan administration, the fruits of which we have been living off of ever since, gave us the strength to help create this current world. Secondly, moral clarity. The hallmark of the Reagan administration's policy, the hallmark of Ronald Reagan's leadership in the world, was a moral clarity about what it was we wanted to do in foreign policy. A clear enunciation of American principles the putting of American principles at the center of our foreign policy. While we're a status quo power, Reagan understood, and we need to understand, that we're also a revolutionary power, because we are the ones who stand for the revolution of democracy that has occurred around the world, and that is a strength of ours, and it's one that we are insufficiently utilizing in the present period. I also think it's important, Reagan had a foreign policy that that encompassed issues of honor and duty. We don't hear too much about duty in the world today. There is a tremendous sense that our only duty these days is to ourselves, and that it is not our problem what happens in the rest of the world. Reagan rejected that understanding, and, and so have many of our other greatest presidents. Theodore Roosevelt, who I think was a, one of the greatest Republican presidents of this century, once said, a nation's first duty is within its borders, but it is not thereby absolved from facing its duties in the world as a whole. And if it refuses to do so, it merely forfeits its right to struggle for a place among the people that shape the destiny of mankind. I think we need to think again 
about whether the United States and the American people can elevate themselves, have an enlightened view of their own self-interest that understands that the fate of peoples around the world is not a matter of disinterest to us, but a matter of our concern. So in order to think about preserving the international order, we need to think about all these issues and make them part of our foreign policy. In our defense structure, we should not be thinking about uh, whether we've got an adequate amount to be able to fight two uh, regional contingencies, as the Pentagon puts it, at one time. The goal of our defense strategy should be supremacy, to maintain the supremacy that we built up and that right now is such a great force for peace in the world. Some people point out that the United States spends more on its defense than the next four, five, or six other powers combined, as if to say that there's a problem there. I think that's great. I think that the world is safer because the United States is spending more on defense. I don't want Germany and Japan and Russia and China to catch up with our, with our military capabilities. I think we need, in our foreign policy, as I've said, to have moral purpose. We cannot just look at China, for instance, as a trading partner. We cannot just put our faith that someday uh, the, the human rights violations will gradually wither away under the force of economic determinism. In my view, we have to recognize that China, in the near term, in the mid term, and certainly in the long term, represents not only a strategic problem for the United States, but a moral threat, uh, not to the United States necessarily itself, but to the values that we hold dear around the world. And I think that as we think about global strategy today, we have to get away from the notion that it all has to be based on the threats that we can see. Right now, the biggest problem we have is we don't know where the next threat is necessarily coming from. That's the good news. But that does not lead us, therefore, to, to weaken ourselves uh, in the hope that we'll be ready next time when the threat does emerge. I would like to see a foreign policy that is engaged in shaping the international environment. I think we should be viewing this period in our history as an opportunity in foreign policy, not just the absence of threat, but the opportunity to ensure that new threats do not, in fact, emerge, because we have maintained the power and the moral clarity to maintain our role in the world and actively to promote the present order as long into the future as possible. I, I won't keep you too much longer, but I, I, and I don't want to presume that I'm talking chiefly to Republicans in this in this, uh, in this room. So if the Democrats here can close their ears for the, next, for the next point that I want to make. But just as a purely political matter, I think it's worth considering the fact that when George Bush left the White House uh, in 1992, the American people had no doubt which party could be trusted in foreign policy. If you took polls on which party you trusted in the White House on matters of national security, defense, and foreign policy. The polls were lopsided. The American people believed the Republican Party could be trusted in foreign policy. Well, we have now seen the consequences of six years of Republican confusion in foreign policy, six years of merely reacting to the latest thing that Clinton does. A recent poll that I saw showed that when asked which party could be trusted on foreign policy and defense matters, the American people said, they trusted both parties equally, or rather mistrusted both parties equally, as the case may be. That is where Republican foreign policy uh, has taken us as a party over the last six years. Ronald Reagan was one of the most successful politicians in American history. He was certainly the most successful Republican politician, uh, at least since Eisenhower, and arguably more so. And I do believe that the foreign policy that Ronald Reagan enunciated strongly supported, the, the America, gave the American people a sense of his greatness. And I th would hope that the Republican Party will see the wisdom of turning back to the, view, the, the general foreign policy approach of Ronald Reagan in the years to come and as we approach this next election. Let me just say in conclusion, it's a commonplace to say that the world is unpredictable. But it really is unpredictable. And those political scientists, all of us foreign policy experts who claim to tell, know, well, this is what's going to happen here in a couple of years, and that's what's going to happen in five years, we missed 
Saddam's invasion of Kuwait. Uh, they missed North Korea's invasion of South Korea. In fact, they missed the collapse of the Soviet Union. All the major events of the last 50 years were vir went virtually unpredicted by all the experts before they happened. With this in mind, that doesn't mean we're all out of business. There's, excuse me, there are still intelligent things to be said in foreign policy, but when you think about the conduct of foreign policy and you recognize that just as Clausewitz spoke of the fog of war, we need to think of the fog of international relations. And in such an uncertain world, which this is, I think that we need to recognize that adherence to a few simple principles may be the best guide through the fog that we have. Those principles we can find in our own nation. Those principles were the kinds of principles that Ronald Reagan stuck to. You may recall that all the wise men thought that Ronald Reagan was a fool. And Ronald Reagan stuck to some basic principles and did a pretty good job in foreign policy. So I would hope that as we look forward uh, into scouting the future as this, uh, as this conference is uh, uh, quotes uh, Bill Casey, that we will recognize the importance of sticking to our fundamental principles, which include strength, military strength, moral clarity, and yes, a sense of duty in our, in our international relations. Thank you very much.